Okay, so I have a little spiel, a little introduction. So just to let you know, again, that you, when you come, come on, you're all on mute um, and that you are being recorded and we're going to put this on the website for the library afterwards. So you can tell people if they didn't get a chance to join us tonight, they can watch it after the fact. Um, if you want to ask questions later on, there'll be a question time and you can write them in the chat box at the bottom. If you don't feel like typing your questions, you can raise your hand and we'll call on you and we'll unmute you so you can ask your question. So Mr. Spencer will talk about himself and his latest book and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our author for tonight. Robert Spencer lived in Massachusetts for 40 years and he ran a company called Min Minerva Designs for 20 years in the Boston area where he designed and built residential gardens. He's a gardener. He's a graduate of UMass Amherst. He currently lives in South Waterford in an old mill building. And please do tell us more about that later. Um, he is the author of The Spinster's Hope Chest, published in 2018. Is that backwards to you guys? Um, and now he is here to talk about his new book, Prospects, Mining Maine for Riches. And this was just published this year in 2020. Um, he's published by Maine Authors Publishing. And again, I'd like to hear more about that later. Um, and Bob is in the Charlotte Hobbs Memorial Library Writing Group. Um, his website is Robert W. Books dot blog and I can write that in the chat a little bit later or maybe Beth you could do that Robert W or or Bob you could do that Robert W books dot blog all right take it away uh, I was told that I was supposed to start with backstory um, Susan's got me uh, programmed here um, a little bit about bio, a bio, biographical. Um, she said I lived in, in Boston for, uh, for, for, for over 40 years. I lived in Charlestown. So that's, um, uh, that's spe specific. Um, people like to know specifically where you live. But I started, um, I was born in uh, 1947, so I'm 50, 73 years old. Um, I grew up on a small farm, a small truck farm, about uh, eight acres of uh, vegetable growing and flower growing in um, Middleborough, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, that, that time was a rural, that was a rural area, if you can believe it, uh, southeastern Massachusetts. Today it's pretty well developed and pretty suburban, but um, that's where I started. That's where I got my, <clears throat> my appreciation, I think, of the, of the natural world and appreciation of the work that goes into gardening and, and uh, horticulture. My, my dad was a horticulturist um, <clears throat> who uh, he and my, my mother had the, the, ran the business from the start. Um, I, I hate to look at my notes because it sounds like I don't know my life, but um, uh, I've, had, I've had many, we moved up here. My wife and I moved up here to South Waterford in um, uh, 19, uh, 2013, we bought this place in uh, 1976. Uh, during that time, between those two dates, we improved the building gradually, time over time over time, a lot we did ourselves, we hired some local contractors. And when we retired from a business called, um, well, Minerva Design was one business we ran, another business we ran was called Irish Natural Stone. Um, we imported uh, Irish limestone from uh, from quarries in Ireland and distributed it around the east coast of the United States. It was used for building material, uh, exterior building for garden design, garden use, and also for um, countertops, flooring, um, that type of thing. Um, <clears throat> but we moved up here in uh, 2013 and turned the place over to a uh, contractor and an architect and moved out and just kept an eye on the building for eight months and we moved back in and it's probably as comfortable as most of the places that you folks live right now. It's very well insulated, new systems and all. Um, my education, uh, I started going, uh, um, I, I went to high school 
that's, that's good, that's important. I went to high school, um, graduated from high school, then went to Marietta College in, uh, in Ohio, was there for a couple of years and then transferred to UMass Amherst and graduated from there with a, with a BA. Um, after that, uh, subsequent to that, I went to um, graduate school uh, at that time, it was called Radcliffe uh, Seminars uh, in Landscape Design, and uh, now it's called uh, Boston Architectural College. Um, while I was there, I decided to start a business as a landscape architect designer. I did builder. I did design build gardens, mostly residential, um, throughout Boston for uh, 15 years. And did about 200, 250 gardens for people in their residences. Um, so my writing, which people probably are interested in, my writing, I've had, I've always been interested in writing. Uh, life didn't offer me the time to do it for the most part. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning, uh, my first poem, I wrote to my mother uh, when she came home with, my, with a sister of mine. You know, I was 10 years old. She came home from the hospital with a new sister. Um, I wrote her uh, my first poem. Um, but before that, I had been trying to write, and we had a house full of books and learned to read at a very early age, learned to read, was reading by the time I was like four. I guess that's early, and early for those days. Um, and during 1974, between jobs, I like to say, because I did so many jobs uh, getting to this point, between jobs, um, I had an opportunity to live at the almost live at the Boston Public Library for um, on about six months every day almost at the library doing research on American Indian culture and Native American culture. And in 74, I was able to make a stab at trying to write a book. Um, I wrote a collection of essay stories um, and uh, it was called Trading with Indians. Um, that's what uh, my friend Bruce Coffin would call a, a, a a drawer novel, it stays in the drawer. You pull it out occasionally and look at it and then you put it back in the drawer. Hopefully at some point it'll, some point it may uh, be able to be pulled out of the drawer and, and turned into something else. Um, then when I retired, I finally had time to sit down and figure out what it was I wanted to do for the next 20 or 30 or how many years I have left. And it was what I'd always wanted to do from the beginning, which was right. I wanted to be, I wanted to write, I wanted to communicate with the written word. I was good at it and I had just hadn't had a chance to, to, to develop it. It takes a lot of work, uh, it takes a lot of practice. And I never had the time to practice. So I wrote poems all the time. I have about you know, probably a couple hundred poems that I wrote and I rewrite and rewrite them again. And that kept me, kept my hand in the writing for, uh, for many years. Um, the first book I started with, the uh, first novel that I wrote was a short novel, it's called Sp The Spinster's Hope Chest. And I'm a historian and I was doing research in the Waterford Historical Society archives uh, one day and I opened up a scrapbook, uh, one of these old scrapbooks that somebody had put together back in the 1950s. I was looking at it and uh, an envelope fell out. The envelope fell out onto the, onto the floor and I picked it up and it was a letter and it was all tattered and torn and I opened it up and it was a letter about the life, the early life of a woman by the name of Lizzie Millet, who was born in Waterford in South Waterford near my house um, in uh, 1861. And the letter was a very sad letter, very sad story, but it caught my attention and I showed it to several people I know and they said, you should do something with this. This is a really good story. It's really sad, but you should really do something with it. So for the next two years, I wrote a book. I wrote a novel. It's a historical novel based on that letter. Um, most of the characters are in that letter. Um, it was interesting, um, but it was a short book, a little short, short book. Um, second one, is the most recent one it just came out this year. It came out was is uh, Prospects uh, Mining Maine for for Riches. Um, it came out on the day it was it was released on the day that the Maine state of Maine closed down at the governor's direction on on March fifteenth. So it's <laughs> it's been as like we all have gone through these problems with with the virus. Mine was mine is selling books. Um, 
you know, uh, I saw a cartoon the other day, <clears throat> uh, someone shared, an author, a, a man running around going, does anybody want to buy a book? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what it's been like. And thankfully, it's worked out pretty well. Um, it's been actually selling better than the other one. Um, mining, made, mining made for riches. Um, it's, it's, ostensibly, it's a story that's based on the history of mining in, in Oxford County um, in between the years of 1897 and 1905. Um, in this area, and actually all over the state, but in this area specifically in, in Oxford County, Cumberland County, um, other areas where many, many people are collectors. Uh, they go out looking for uh, minerals like this one. This is a piece of mica. Uh, let see if I can get the light to shine on it from here. It's, um, this was found in the, under the basement, uh, on the crawl space under the floor of a uh, a house here in, in South Waterford that was remodeled and gutted out and remodeled. There were five or six of these that were buried underneath the crawl, in the crawl space. Someone thought enough of them when they found them, the house was built in the 1830s. Someone thought enough of them, so they just hid them in there for, for some reason. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a black tourmaline or a shawl. This is the stone which is the, um, the, the crystal of Maine. This is the official crystal of Maine. It's, it's not, very, uh, not very decorative. It's not nothing that would be uh, able to be turned into a, a piece of jewelry, but this is something that is a nice specimen. Um, or beryl. Here's a green. I don't know if you can see the green. You can see a slight green tone to this. This is a piece of barrel that came from a mine here in Waterford that it was opened during the 1900, early 1900s, but is now closed and overgrown. This is a, you can see it has six sides. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a well-formed crystal. So there are many people who are collecting these um, and ostensibly the story is about those, about the people that were characters that were, were out digging for these things during the during the turn of the century. Um, but it's not just about that. If it was about that, all we'd have to do would be to go to the museum up in, in, um, in Bethel. Um, beautiful place if anyone's not been there. The Bethel Museum is celebrating the 200th anniversary of the discovery of the first tourmaline in, um, in, in Maine at Mount Micah in West Paris. Um, but it's more than that. It's more than the book. There's more of the book. Basically, this, this is the crystal of the cover. That's the first tourmaline. It, they've been, it's been labeled the primus. Uh, it's hard to see. Um, again, it's, it's nicely, nice and green. Um, this was for 19, 1820, the year that Maine became a state. This was discovered in Paris, Maine. Right, that's, the, that's the cover. And it's about that crystal, that crystal act in my book. The crystal acts as a magnet. What it does is it pulls people in from out of state, people from other parts of the state, in to make their money to strike it rich here in Maine um, with mixed results. Um, the characters that I find, the characters in the book, some of them are, are based on real life characters that I discovered, I, I came upon when I was doing research for um, a, a 2016 presentation to the Waterford Historical Society on the history of, of mining in Waterford. And nothing ever came of it, much of what was done here in Waterford. Um, thank goodness. I mean, if we had, if, we, if, there was a, if there were nine mines that were opened at one time or another here in Waterford, if there were nine mines here in Waterford that stayed open, the place would be totally different from what you see today. It would not be a farming community. It would not be um, a wooded area uh, with lots of uh, natural sites. It would have been a bunch of holes in the ground with potential water pollution um, and, and damage to the environment. So thankfully that didn't happen. But in looking for the research, I found, came upon some characters, and one of the characters is the main character in this book. And Sue and Kay uh, Dung have read, the, I know they've read the book, so they can agree or disagree with me. The main character, his name is Clarence Leslie Potter. 
Clarence Leslie Potter, was a man who was born in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. He became a, uh, his family was in the, uh, a, 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 an, in the iron mine business. Um, and he ended up going to becoming a copper miner in Ontario, Western Ontario, um, during the late 1800s. Um, the man is not a true protagonist. Would you agree? Uh, the man is conflicted. Uh, the man has a lot of problems, but he tries his best to strike it rich. He tries his best to make enough money to help his family. He tries to make, the, make a living off of the mines with mixed results. So um, that's, that's my books. Um, I continue to try to write, I'm writing a third one. Right now I've got about um, oh, 90,000 words in it. Right now I've got another 10 or 15,000 to go before I get into the draft is finished and I start editing it out. Uh, but um, that's, I guess that's my backstory. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please ask. I don't know. But <laughs> um, um, anyway. uh, could you read a little bit from uh, your book? I will. Um, as I say, Susan's got me all prepared here. Um, there's a myth <clears throat> in, in Maine, a myth, I guess myth anywhere, that one of the, one of the myths is that you can be, if you can you strike it rich, if you can just become rich overnight, how wealthy you will be, how much better it will make your life. And the myth in this area is based on, one of the myths is based on mining. So the prologue of, of uh, prospects, I'll read from that. Elijah Hamlin and Ezekiel Holmes strike it rich in Paris, Maine. The two college students are out for a hike on Mount Micah the day the summer vacation is ending in 1820. They come upon a fallen maple tree within whose exposed roots are embedded several radiant green tourmaline, tourmalines the size of your thumbnail. The crystals gleam so brightly in the fading sunlight that the young men know for sure these must be as valuable as emeralds in a queen's crown. When they return to the site in the spring, they carry home bucket after bucket of tourmalines. They actually had buckets, they were actually filled buckets out of tourmalines. And so these people, that's, that's part of how the myth starts. These people actually were able to find the buckets of tourmaline just lying in a hole in the ground or in the roots of a tree. Um, that would go up to um, we'll go another part of the prologue, Frank Parham. Uh, people know Frank Parham. Frank Parham was considered to be uh, the gem man. He's, he's still alive. He, he's, he's done a lot of work. He's quite, getting quite old now, but still very, very vital as a, a miner. Uh, who knows his business and is a, he's subcontract, subcontracts out. He has, he used to be, he used to run the uh, Parham's gem, sh gem shop in West Paris, which is closed a few years ago. But Frank Parham strikes it rich in October 28, 1972. At the Dunton mine in New Remain, Frank Parham, Maine's gem man, squeezes his torso into a small pocket and the pegmatite, the pegmatite being where these gems come from, the type of rock and stone where the gems come from. As his flashlight sweeps over the stony enclosure, the beam glints off large green and orange crystals. He and partner Macrillus expand the opening and they remove 200 pounds of gemmy quality tourmaline. 200 pounds, wow, that's great. Most of us walk around looking for things like, like this as, a, as, a, as a specimens, but the people, 200 pounds, they couldn't carry them off. They had, they had buckets to carry them off, but the buckets weren't big enough. So they actually had to go get wheelbarrows in order to be able to get the, get the stone off of the site. Now, that's a myth. That's part of the myth. Now that's true. I mean, that's true, but it's part of what feeds the myth. That same mine in Newry, the, the Dutton mine, the first time the Dutton mine was open, and it's in the book, it's at the beginning of the book. The first time the Dutton mine was open was in um, 1895 or 96. Um, 
the Dutton family had the mine. They, they, they thought it was a valuable piece of property. They had found some interesting looking stones. They bought the property and they started to dig in, in a mine looking for minerals that they could sell. They found some, they opened it up. It ran for two years. They, first year they broke even, uh, second year, maybe they broke even, but after that, there wasn't very much available. So they closed it down and sold it to someone else and it went through a succession of owners. Um, in 1953, the owners in 1953 went in with better technology, better blasting techniques, better, better hammers, better men. They actually were able to find a second vein of, of valuable gem, gemmy materials. And they walked off with something that allowed them to make some money off of the site. But that only lasted for a couple of years. And then they went out of business and sold it to somebody else. So it wasn't until 1972 that Frank Perrin was able to find 200 pounds of jemmy material of, of tourmaline. So that's the story in a nutshell is things start and stop and start and stop and start and stop and everyone thinks that they're going to make a lot of money, but then it might not work out. Um, there are many such true stories about mining that get rich quick fantasies fill the minds of every miner whether professionals who move from prospect to prospect looking for the mother load or amateurs who tote bucket, spade and hammer out to an abandoned mine on weekends. If only they say as the hammer snaps off the piece of quartzite or a blast of dynamite opens the bowels of the earth. If only I could be one of those who finds their fortune in an instant. So that's you know, that's, that's, uh, that's it. Um, it's based on that. Um, but there were other people back in the early days of Maine, um, a different type of people who weren't digging in, in the dirt, digging in the, in, in the woods to find um, the value of things they could sell. Um, there were other people who were naturalists um, maybe the 1870s, 1880s, early 1890s, they were more into collecting like, like I am or like other people are today. They were looking for things that would, would be beautiful and would show them what, the, what nature was like. Um, they really weren't in it for profit. They were in it for the glory and, um, and the education. They were educating themselves and, and allowing the rest of the world to know. Um, I'll read you a little bit. Okay, um, Dr. Abbott, Dr. Francis Abbott is from Bethel. And he was a doctor. Um, of course, in those days, we don't know exactly what he was a doctor of, but he was a doctor. And he was also an investor. He invested in mines. Um, didn't make his money on it. Uh, his main, he was, had other, other sources of income, but he invested in mines. Um, he's, in, he's visiting a mine in um, the Dunton mine as it's been uh, being, uh, d being opened. Um, <clears throat> so his, his, and he has the bookkeeper who's working with him. Dr. Abbott came into the office. He sat in a chair opposite Nathan and lit his pipe. Hallett, how have we done so far? Should I have a shot of bourbon to celebrate or to drown my sorrows? Can't answer that question yet. Francis, it takes forever to decipher this little scratch marks on most of these slips. I have to wipe dried mud off some of them in order to read the figures. Who makes out these records every day? The doctor says, likely the only man nearby who has a pencil. These are miners, Nathan, not notaries. They can blast and drill and pick out crystals without breaking them to bits but they don't really give a damn about keeping records. Look at this one, doctor, said Nathan. Can you make out whether this says one half ton or one eighth? After staring and squinting at the paper for a second, Abbott answered, can't tell for sure, but I, I record it as one half ton. Give it the best guess, so to speak. All right. The doctor clapped his hands, slapped Nathan on the shoulder. If this, 
this is our only problem. Oh, I skipped a part, but let's do this. As Abbott prepared to leave, he knocked his pipe on the tab table edge, spilling ashes on the floor. Quote, I had a friend in Waterford. He was a naturalist or a scientist who made the collection of crystals, rocks, and minerals part of his, his life's work. James Shaw was his name. He began collecting when he was a boy, running through his father's fields on the slopes of Beach Hill. When I was but a sprout, he would take me to the deep holes he had dug where all types of specimens had been found, not just pretty crystals, but pieces of granite, shale, sandstone, things he could put on display case as examples of natural elements. Why would he, why would he select so many common rocks? He wanted to have a piece of every stone in the world and even sent a way to have exotic pieces shipped in by mail order. When he died earlier this year, this is 1897, when he died earlier this year, the family offered to sell me an enormous collection, but I have no place to put it. I did take the best pieces, green and orange tourmalines, purple amethysts, lovely blue and green barrels, gave them a good price for those. They put the rest in a couple of boxes for storage in the attic. Did he ever sell the best of the pieces he found? Not that I know of. It was the collecting he wanted, not the selling. He was very comfortable financially. And it wasn't only f minerals. He collected leaves and branches from trees, every sort of plant. He had a conservatory for his palms and tropicals. So as you said, he was a scientist. Very much so. I'm not like that at all. Collecting is a hobby I enjoy, but the selling is a way to make my fortune swell. James was a man of an earlier generation who had a great desire to learn about the natural world. He taught me enough to know how to use nature to my advantage. I don't know if any venture will become a boom or a bust, but each one shows me more of the world. If this, one, if this gem mine fails, there's always another. Um, just a sidelight on that. Um, James Shaw was a real man. Uh, when he died, there was a clipping in a local paper, uh, Lewiston, Lewiston paper at the time, with a list of, um, of uh, a story about a party that he had had before his death. And he, um, he invited people in and he spent the entire evening touring people, taking people around inside his greenhouses and his, uh, showing them his topiaries and his, and his crystals and his, all of that he had collected. It was, it was part of his life. When he died, this man, this man went in and cherry picked all the best minerals out of the collection. He said he left it the rest to be put in boxes in an attic. My friend David Sanderson, who lives in East Waterford, and a farm that his great grandfather built, um, had those boxes in his attic. And when I was doing research, I found them. I found them. Each of the pieces there are five five boxes that weighed about eighty pounds each. And in each, each piece had a number on it. And there was a, a journal that the man had kept, the shard kept. And each number identified the rock, what type of mineral it was, where it came from, and when he bought it, and how he got it. So he was, he was different than miners and collectors uh, that we know of. So that's, there's a number of different things. Should I read more? Or people have questions? Beth is one. Yeah, I have a couple questions. It's so interesting. Thank you, Bob. I really, I really enjoy that. Um, I mean, as a kid, I was brought to different places like Lord's Hill to look for tourmaline mines. We never saw, found any tourmaline or anything, but I remember looking a lot with my right. mom or my grandma, um, which I think Joe mentioned in her message before she left. Um, I, when I was reading about your book, um, you have such unusual names for your characters. I wanted to know where you got them, if they have any significance or some interesting names in the book. Wow, the names of the characters? Yeah, uh -huh. where did, do you go, how do you come about their names? What, like, like Afia? Yeah. Uh, Afia, oh, Afia. Afia. you know, <laughs> uh, I'm going to read something about Afia later on. Um, the, the characters, um, a lot of the characters' names come from my research, they actually, 
they existed. Uh, they may, I've been warned not to do that uh, in subsequent writing that I want to stay away from that, especially as I get up to later, later periods of time in my writing uh, because there can be potential legal problems um, because that the names like Clarence Leslie Potter, uh, his, his wife um, um, and various, the, 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 the Lizzie and Annie Millett, that's, they're, they're actual people. Um, the other characters though, it's pretty easy. Um, as long as I stay within the time frame. I mean, uh, 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 Afia, Afia, Afia was actually born in Norway, uh, the, the real Afia. And I had her name in there and then I was reading uh, a, a book about something else and this name was in it, it was Afia. And I said, what, what is that? What's that mean? So I, I looked at it, it caught my attention. So I decided I would change the name of the character to Afia. Afia Stevens, um, but a lot of the characters' names are real. I picked them out of the out of the research. Um, more and more, though, in the third book, um, that's probably be hopefully be out next year. The third book, there's a lot of characters that I'm I'm just trying to name them based on uh, the time frame. The next one takes place from uh, 1905 until 1910. Again. The names are kind of archaic. I would try to keep within that time frame. Does that answer your question? Okay, I'll read more. Oh, Sue has a. Sue's, well, read, I, Sue's read both books, by the way. So. I have. I couldn't stop reading them. I couldn't put them down. They're just really great. I wanted to hear more about how you publish and what your process is like do you have to wait for to be accepted to, or did you self-publish how did you how did you go about it um it's a kind of a, a cross crossword publisher it's a, it's a small house small publishing house main authors publishers up in thomaston <clears throat> they are kind of a niche market they they specialize in main authors either the books are about main or or written by people who are who who um, who live in Maine. Um, how do I come about writing? I, I looked for, I looked six months when I was writing the first book, I took six months and did a lot of research on what type of, I didn't think I was gonna get a contract. I wouldn't think I was gonna be published by a, a major publishing company because of my age partly, because I started late. Um, and also because the topics that I write about are not particularly uh, thus far, not with that first one, especially were not per, like general of general interest. Um, these folks offered me a package that uh, I would be like a self publisher. I'd pay for the package of services that they offered, just pick the ones that I thought made the most sense, and then they helped to promote it. They have a, a network of bookstores and um, and uh, libraries and. Uh, other um, areas that they and they sell the books. If, you, if they sell the books, they get you on Amazon. Um, um, so it's like a mix. Uh, it's a small house, small publishing house. Um, and the process I went through uh, is I, I write the draft, I edit it, I edit it again. <laughs> and then when I'm tired of editing, Kay Dunn, Kathleen Dunn here, she was one of my um, prime readers for, um, for uh, prospects. So when I'm done with the, as much editing as I feel comfortable doing, I ask other people to, to read it and give me feedback and then I write another draft. Uh, at that point, when that's done, <clears throat> I turn it over to an editor. Uh, the editor does, edits the, uh, copy editor edits, uh, edits and the ones that I've had, the one I've had is it, up in Thomas has been fabulous. Um, lots of suggestions, lots of questions about timing, uh, such as uh, in the first book I had a man wearing, a, a kid wearing a baseball cap. And the editor says, no, they didn't have baseball caps in, uh, in 1870. He may have had a cap, but it wasn't a baseball cap. So, you know, that type of, of, uh, of dating. Um, Kay, as a, as, a, as a historian, was very, very helpful in that too. And, um, so, and then once, once the final edit's done, um, we print, we make the cover. You know, this, is, this cover, 
that gem is on display at the museum in Bethel. Uh, it, it's in the it's in the uh, permanent collection of the Museum of Na American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and um, I saw it. I wanted to use it for my cover, and I contacted the museum, and they gave me a three-year three-year uh, license to use it for the for a three-year period. So it's a lot of a lot of creativity and a lot of personal creativity, but big help from professional people too. Shall I read more? Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to read something from the first book. Um, somebody mentioned a fear. I guess everybody. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fear is an interesting character. She's another conflicted character, I, I would say. Okay, this, uh, this would be the first time we see a fear. Uh, she's 14 years old. Uh, she, so it would be like uh, the 1875 uh, in Norway. <clears throat> Athea Stevens was quite tall. Oh, excuse me. Was quite tall for 14. She had the looks and airs of a much older woman. Her public school friends were often jealous, resenting the attention given to her by boys her own age and even those who had graduated from high school. Several of Rosamond Stevens' good friends, that's her mother, wrote good friends, had actually stopped visiting with their husbands because the men flirted with the young girl. Exasperated by two incidents in which older boys had followed Afia home from school and stood around in front of the house refusing to leave and shouting out for her daughter to come outside, Rosamond had taken to sending her visit, sending her to visit the Whitcomb farm for the summer and school holidays. Waterford, so rural compared to Norway, seemed to be a safe heaven, haven. The girl took well in the home, took well to her home away from home, doing whatever household and farm chores needed to be done. Her grandmother, who was quite lame, was ever so grateful for the distant, for the, for the assistance with household chores. Afia was especially fond of time spent with Grandpa Abe. She rushed to complete laundry cleaning and other indoor work each morning in order to help with haying, plowing, and caring for the Morgan horses that he was raising to sell. She was also strong for such a young woman, nearly keeping up with her older brother Ron when he mowed and gathered hay on days off from school. Farmer Whitcomb sometimes chastised his granddaughter for working like a boy. But he was most impressed with her stamina. Afia, dear girl, when you're old enough to marry, it might prove hard to find a husband who wants a wife as strong as he is. He chided her in jest. Then I'll not marry. I'll just stay here with you and the horses. She loved the farm life so much that upon return to school, after each vacation, Afia found it very difficult to concentrate on classwork. Her mind wandered back to Waterford when she was supposed to be studying. In particular, she was obsessed over the horses, which now numbered nine, two old work nags and had, had been many years and the seven prize Morgans. Her grandfather had purchased these over time as he could afford it in order to boost farm income. Morgans were a popular military breed, good at pulling wagons with heavy, heavy loads and could be ready, readily sold to farmers and stage drivers. During lectures, while other students diligently took notes, a fia, a pen in, a pen in hand, would absently, absentmindedly sketch horse heads with a name scribbled under each. Her mother complained that she daydreamed most of the time. And though she completed most of her chores at home, her mind was usually elsewhere. Girl, this is mother, a father actually. Girl, you have got to concentrate on what you were supposed to be doing with your, little, with your life, said his father one night after dinner. She had just dropped her full dinner plate, vegetables, chicken and gravy lay scattered on the carpet. She cried out in frustration, hands waving over her head. Daddy, what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? 
my friends do not want to be with me anymore. Boys are always staring at me and making rude comments. I hate my teachers. I just want to go live with grandpa on the farm. I fear you are an intelligent, hardworking young girl with a very bright life ahead of you. Farm life is not what you should be doing. On hands and knees, she picked up broken plate fragments and food from the floor, rushed to the kitchen and tossed it into a trash bucket. He did not know how she felt. He was just like mom, always planning to ruin her life. Maybe she could run away, maybe be make believe that she, that she was 18 and get married. She looked old enough to perhaps marry a Waterford farmer who would buy the farm. Then she would be happy. Okay, so that's, she's a 14. <clears throat> so now it's up to this book. That's a comparison. Uh, this is fun, this is a fun comparison. I see how far she's developed. I hate to tell you where she is in this third book, but uh, <clears throat> Francina, how are you? Francina is the is the niece of Lizzie Millet. Lizzie Millet is the main character, the heroine, whatever, the protagonist of the first book. Uh, Lizzie is a spinster, and at that time, spinsters were anyone, any woman married or unmarried of any age who used the spinning wheel to spin thread in order to make a contribution to the community or to the, to the household. All right. I had to get out my chest because that's been, a, I've had some complaints about using that word in the title. It's a, it's a, it has some negative connotations these days. But anyway, so Francina hurried into the kitchen where Liz was preparing dinner. She was in such a rush that she caught her foot on the table leg and almost fell. Auntie, you must come with me. There's a someone at the door to see you, a wild looking woman who has tied her horse to our rail out front. Her words came so rapidly and at such a high pitch, Liz could not understand her. Slow down, girl, you'll hurt yourself. Now, take a deep breath and start over. I'm sorry, but you really need to come with me right away. I answered the, a loud knock at the front door and saw this woman standing there. She's wild looking. She shouted to me that she wants to see you immediately, said, you know what it's about. As Liz walked into the shop with her niece close behind, she was shocked to see Athea Stevens, who had entered the room and now stood next to one of the design tables. Design tables is uh, it's a dress shop. Lizzie has a dress shop. And so they're walking into the office. Um, she was dressed all in black from her knee-high knee leather boots to the sweaty kerchief that held back her hair. Her black dress was dirty with mud spattered along the hemline and large sweat marks had formed under her arms. Jammed between, behind a sash at her waist, the handle of a pistol was clearly visible. At Liz's entry, she laughed maniacally and drew her arm across the table scattering papers and pencils across the room. I warned you, miss. I warned you the last time I was here. You were not to delve into my private life anymore. You paid no attention to my warning. Now I'm back. Liz stood stock still, then pushed Francina back into the kitchen. Miss Stevens, Afia Stevens, get out of my house. She pointed to the open front door but remained standing near the kitchen entry, ready to jump out of the way if her visitor became violent. You are not welcome here, she said firmly. Miss Lizzie, Sophia sneered, I'm likely as welcome here as you and your friends are at my house. Her voice grew louder. Why do you continue to torment, torment me? Send your friends to investigate me. I'm the one who should be angry, not you. I don't know what you're talking about, Afia. <coughs> there has been no effort on my part to bother you. Now please leave my house right now. The wild woman turned, screamed, and rushed toward Liz with both arms in the air. But Liz held her ground and put up her own hands to fight off the attack. Afia suddenly came to a halt within a foot of her, of her target and put her right hand on the, on the gun handle. My dear, she said quite calmly, I have brought my Colt pistol with me. I am skilled at its use. Do not put me 
in a position to draw it. Liz said nothing and lowered her hand to her sides. Franny, who had exited the kitchen and entered the office from the rear, picked her head out from, be poked her head out from behind one of the sewing machines. Miss Millet, I understand that your husband has died. I would not want you to join him so early in your own life. Now listen, listen to me very, very carefully. You are not to send your man Nathan Hallett, his friend Potter, or any other of your people to bother me anymore. This is the second time I have warned you and I want it to be the last. They came to my place on the pretense of getting permission to cross my land. They even gave me money to be cooperative, but I'm not easily fooled, miss. I know what you're doing. You're trying to get even with me for making your fiance, for taking your fiance now that you are alone again. You want to ruin my life so that it is miserable as your own. What a great character she is. She's, she's all grown up. <laughs> yeah. A couple of people have questions. That was great. Um, Bob, I have a question. As a historian, is this your particular interest, like 18, uh, mid 18, mid 1800s in Maine? Or what is your particular interest as a historian? What do you study mostly? Once I started with the first book, <clears throat> um, all right. Uh, let's see. South Waterford <clears throat> in that period of time is a very, very interesting community. Um, <clears throat> we live on a little stream that runs between uh, Keoka, that's between the lake, and Bear Pond. It's a mile and a quarter. Uh, little stream now it's, it meanders around back and forth, doesn't seem very powerful. At one point during, during the mid 1800s, um, it was, there were nine mills and assorted outbuildings along the stream. And <clears throat> when I came here and bought this building, this was one of those mills. And so I started delving into the history of this building and ended up finding out more and more and more about the history at that time of these other mill buildings. Um, we are, <clears throat> I've set up, I'm the president pro tem, I guess, of a uh, uh, temporary president of a group called um, Friends of City Brook, which is City Brook, it used to be Millbrook, now City Brook. And what we're trying to do is build a trail. We've got half of it done along the brook from between, <clears throat> between the pond and the lake and highlight the various mill sites that are existing, <clears throat> remnants are existing, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, signs, uh, interpretive signs. So yeah, so uh, it's, it's a fascinating history, period of history to me. Um, but I think that's always been the case is I'm always very fascinated by the history of the place that I live in. Charlestown was fascinating. Charlestown, um, <clears throat> going back to the Indians in Charlestown um, and then up to the, the, the Revolutionary War and all that, that period was very fascinating to me. Uh, but I'm also, once I found that first book, once I found that letter, the woman was born in 1861, it become the first of a series. So I've got 1861 up to 1888, then 1897 to 1905. So the next one is 1905 to 1910. Um, so that's, that's, so I'm interested in all those periods. I'm a history nut, I guess. Nancy had a question. Um, can you hear me? Am I knocked out? No, mm -hmm. no. okay. Um, <clears throat> well, you would, would you call your genre then historical fiction because you start with the seed of that letter and you said you use the names of the people in the letter for your, your characters right? and maybe some of that plot, but then you go from there. Is that what you did with that one book? Exactly. Uh, <clears throat> historical fiction. Uh, it's based on fact of one sort or another. It could be just a historical period. Um, based on happenings that happen, national, ha national or international happenings of a certain period, or it could be individual lives that, that happened for people that were not famous, uh, just the small people, the people that were, were, that everybody has a story. And some of the small people have perhaps the most, in, in, in common people have the most interesting stories. So yeah, it's historical fiction. Um, there's a number of good writers now. Um, 
um, this is, uh, that are using historical fiction. There's a basis for, for some very, very good books. Um, in, in our publishing house, we have two other authors um, who, um, um, Irene Drago um, has written two books about Bath, about the, <coughs> the, 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 the history of the boat building in, in the town of Bath, Maine. Uh, <clears throat> Deb Gould, who lives near Bangor, has uh, two books that she's written about uh, uh, five families who, during the colonial period, settled along this small river called the Eastern, the Eastern River. And she's got the second one out. <clears throat> it follows the five families through generation after generation after generation. Um, and there's a lot of truth in that, a lot of true happenings and a lot of social truths. Um, but um, there's some, quite a bit of good writing in social in um, historical fiction these days. May I follow up with something? You do seem to do a really good job with the female characters. And how do you feel about that, trying to write through the eyes of a female character? That is a great question. <clears throat> That's a question that comes up a lot. Um, and. I've had a chance to think about it a lot. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I talk about it often. That, first of all, I don't really distinguish between the male and the female characters. Um, my characters are <clears throat> the characters, they're humans. Um, they have characteristics, they have personalities, they have life histories. Um, the way they interact creates the story. The way the characters come together and their relationships actually has, is, creates a story. But as far as being able to portray women, I consciously have made an effort to portray women in stronger roles than they have been at that time. It's not, and they're not historical. We, um, um, and they're not particularly true to the his, to the history. Um, Kay disagrees. Um, now there have always been strong women like that. There have always been women store owners. There have you know in the in the seventeenth century, uh, there were several women who took over their became widows and took over their husbands' printing presses and were critically important to getting some issues out that were printed. You know to help get the Revolutionary War started in New York City. I mean, it's, it, there have always been, you know, even back into the Middle Ages when women would uh, be in charge of convents and run, you know, very, uh, very strong convents. Um, you know, they had to keep everybody fed and have enough money and all of that kind of thing. So there have all, so yes, you do do strong women, but strong women have always been part of every historical epic. I think I, I can illustrate that what I, what I said, uh, maybe clearer. Um, the Hattie and Lizzie Millet, born in 1861 and 1863. When they were born, they, on the farm, they had very little future offered to them other than marriage and children perhaps teaching, perhaps they were able to teach, and, and spinsterhood, right. um, um, being taken care of their family, of, the, of their sisters and brothers' children. Um, and the, specifically Lizzie and Hattie, their father was, an, was a, a bastard. Their father was an alcoholic. He was cruel to their mother. Their mother died when Lizzie was nine. Um, <clears throat> Lizzie then had to raise her daughter, her sister, because her father wanted nothing to do with her. So they went through a whole series of moving from family, grandparents to uncle, back to grandparents, living with various parts of the family. In the letter about Lizzie's life, the writer of the letter who knew her, sort of, at the end of her life, she knew her somewhat, or knew her in history, said, she had a miserable life. She never was happy. She never, never was, was, um, had found a, a, a husband, never had had a family. And one, one I can remember this is pathetic was, um, she put up a good front during the day, but at night her pillow was soaked with tears. 
Um, <laughs> that was in the letter. So, so those two, melodramatic. Those, but, yeah, but those, but I know. Oh yeah, but those two characters, those two women, they succeeded. They made it through, and they became, especially Lizzie, became a, a successful business person. So she became one of those strong people that Kay is talking about. But I think to go back to Nancy, if I could. I grew up with three sisters. <laughs> I thought um, so. <laughs> I, um, I have a wonderful wife who <clears throat> is, has two sisters that live up here with us and, and in the neighborhood. Um, it seems to me that one of the things that will be that, that helpful for the future is that we have more women leaders and we have more women who are who are authority and more women who can help to direct the country and to direct uh, direct society so so in that sense you know, I, I i think it's i think that women characters should be strong <laughs> <laughs> well they are and they're very different i mean you have you have althea who is malevol malevolently strong. Yep. You have um, Lizzie who's really strong and then her sister uh, who who follows a more traditional lifestyle but is is stronger than some women within that lifestyle. Right. Do you um yeah that's uh, that's yeah that's true. Um, okay do you more questions or more reading or this is great it's eight o'clock shall i read anything else i have to go are there any other questions i don't think so I just I, where we get the book where can we get your book the, oh, i'm going to talk about one. that too yeah okay the mining one um so well I, what i wanted to say was that um his books, well, our Meet the Author series through the Charlotte Hobbs Library is sponsored by Bridgeton Books in Bridgeton and White Birch Books in North Conway. So you can get books there. Um, and you can also go to Bob's website, correct? Right, okay. Yep. I will direct you, I would direct you to the uh, publisher. The publisher would be the person that people who would... Who Main would, uh, Authors Publishing. Right, but that's on, that information is on my website. Also, it's Amazon, we're on Amazon. Uh, we, try, we try to deal with the bookstores more than with Amazon. The uh, bookstores need our support, especially during the COVID. But do you ha are your books actually in white purchase? Because you, you said before you didn't think they were. I don't think they are. I think it's after order. Should have to order. Um, I, I also mentioned that uh, Adrian Cote, who runs it, the bookstore at Doorway, the, the Tribune, she's she has a, she has both books. She stocks them. Uh, she's been very supportive. Um, also, all of the um, um, Sherman sites, there's five Sherman sites. They they all are selling the book, and um, there's a number of other places, other other bookstores around the state. Um, nobody in Massachusetts. Sorry, Beth. <laughs> well, she's actually in the process of moving up here. Oh, yeah. really? Has moved. Um, so, well, thank you all for coming very, very much. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Bob. Com coming up in our- thank you. thank you very much. Meet the Author series is uh, Kate Christensen on Thursday, November 19th at seven, another Zoom. Uh, Kate Christensen is the author of seven novels, including The Great Man, which won the 2008 Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction, and most recently, The Last Cruise, as well as two food-centric memoirs, Blue, Pl Blue Plate Special <laughs> and How to Cook a Moose. <laughs> which won the 2016 Maine Literary Award for Memoir. So that should be an interesting author as well. We've had a great mix of authors in this series, and I've, I've just been thoroughly enjoying it. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you very thank much. You, Bob. For, uh, really thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't forget to vote.